I, um, I learned uh, over the weekend uh, of the death of Claude Levi-Strauss. I don't know if you read it in the paper yeah. or if you know who Claude Levi-Strauss was. Claude Levi-Strauss, who was 101 years old when he died, was a great French anthropologist, uh, the founder of the school of structuralism, though he would never admit to, to that. Uh, a truly uh, remarkable intellectual figure of the 20th century uh, who traveled through the jungles of Brazil and uh, wrote a number of um, very important uh, anthropological books and one, uh, a memoir called Triste Tropique, uh, 54, 55, uh, which is uh, truly a beautiful, beautiful book. And uh, I was very moved uh, reading the obituary uh, in that he said at one point that he had learned uh, to pursue uh, the truth doggedly and also uh, had the idea of reviving something from the past while reading Don Quixote as a child in a children's uh, edition, obviously translated uh, into, uh, into French. So uh, I thought that I would mention that uh, beginning the class and also uh, as an homage to, uh, to a, real, a really great uh, 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 figure of, uh, of our day. Um, I have been insisting in my last uh, few lectures on how Cervantes rewrites episodes from part one in part two and I want to begin today with some general statements, statements on this theme and a few other general statements as we approach the end of the novel. Uh, first I want to make clear uh, that not all episodes in part two are modeled after others in part one. There is no antecedent really for the Cave of Montesinos adventure, in, uh, and, uh, which is the highlight of part two and perhaps of the whole book. Nor is there really an antecedent for the Clavileño flight. Uh, so there are a number of important episodes in part two that are are not modeled on episodes from part uh, one. You will get to see, as I announced, uh, episodes in part two that repeat or rewrite episodes within part two itself, which is very interesting. Second, I want to emphasize that the rewritings and expansions, uh, that the rewritings are expansions of those uh, uh, episodes in part one. They are like blow-ups. Uh, one could say, uh, of episodes in part one. They tend to have more characters and the actions are outrageous in comparison to their predecessors. For instance, there is uh, something of the fight with the Basque in Don Quixote's encounter with Sanson Carrasco, disguised as the Knight of the Mirrors, but the second episode is, is richer. Uh, in the first, they are both mounted, armed, and Don Quixote wins. Uh, the same occurs in the second, but now his opponent is playing the role of uh, a knight. His outfit reflects uh, Don Quixote literally and metaphorically, and the whole setup is carefully prepared to resemble uh, uh, a contest between two knights. Uh, none of this uh, is, is present in the in the earlier episode. This expansion or enlargement is, 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 in consonant, is consonant with the increasingly baroque aesthetics of part two and each instance of a rewriting is like one more proof of it, uh, one more proof of this, of this baroque uh, aesthetics. Cervantes has not remained the same in the uh, ten years that have elapsed between parts one uh, and two, and the old Cervantes uh, is his own measure of development, as it were. I don't know if I make myself clear, that is, the, the Cervantes of part one is the measure for his new uh, sense of, of development. In the episodes that I will be discussing today, 
and in subsequent lectures, this process of expansion is itself expanded, uh, reaching the limits of representation, uh, which is, again, also a characteristic of the uh, Baroque. I also want to insist on something that I have only hinted at in uh, previous lectures and that you may have noticed on your own. The increasing presence of Virgil and his Aeneid as we move towards the end of the second part of the Quixote. Uh, I will be more specific on, about this when we get to, the, to meet Altisidora, whom you may have, have already met if you have read far enough into the book, who is a parody or model after Dido. But I just want to mention it because the Virgilian background may suggest something important about how Cervantes conceived Don Quixote in his second part. Aeneas is known for his prudence, for his sense of duty, from the very beginning when he carries Anchises on his back as they leave a burning Troy, and when he repeatedly fends off temptations, Dido being the most memorable, so that he can fulfill his destiny, which will be nothing less than the founding of Rome. Aeneas has uh, the greatest excuse for leaving a woman in the whole of Western literature. I've got to go found Rome. <laughs> um, Don Quixote cannot aspire to such a grand design. But Cervantes has given him a different, no less serious one. And one that is uh, uh, consonant with the age in which he lives, which is no longer the heroic age of Virgil's characters. And that design is to conquer himself. This is going to be Don Quixote's task. The evolution of the mad Don Quixote towards sanity and self-knowledge is the modern equivalent of Aeneas's prudence and task of founding the great city. This, it seems to me, is the overall suggestion in these repeated allusions, direct and indirect, to Virgil. Before, of course, I spoke of Homer, Ovid, and Dante, and, and about how Cervantes' uh, field of allusions and sources had moved up from the romances of chivalry to the core of the Western tradition, without abandoning, of course, the romances of chivalry. I also want to emphasize, I've already mentioned it, uh, that in these episodes that are rewritings and in these major episodes in part two, there is a strong presence of death one way or another. Uh, sometimes, as in the pageant in the forest, is the very figure of death uh, as an allegorical uh, uh, figure of death uh, uh, that you, uh, I'm sure, uh, remember. Uh, this is very much, again, and I will be emphasizing it uh, today in one of the episodes, very much uh, uh, a part of the, of the Baroque. Before I, uh, I, move, uh, I move on to some of the truly uh, outrageous episodes that I want to discuss today, let me say something about Sancho's letter to his wife and about the exchange of letters that takes place in this section of the novel. Cervantes, who anticipated so many things in the novel, I think I've mentioned before that Garcia Marquez, the great Colombian writer, said that everything that a novelist could possibly want to do is already in Cervantes. Well, Cervantes, in these uh, uh, exchanges of letters, is anticipating epistolary fiction. Um, the letters to, to Teresa, between Teresa and the Countess, and so forth. Uh, there are antecedents uh, in, in Spanish uh, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, the epistol for epistolary fiction, but here Cervantes in a, in a modern, uh, already modern novel, is uh, anticipating that kind of fiction. 
The epistolary novel is one in which the whole uh, novel consists of an exchange of letters uh, between the characters. Uh, as a genre, it became very popular in the 18th century, as I'm sure uh, you know, in the works of authors such as uh, Samuel Richardson with his immensely successful novels Pamela, 1740, and Clarissa, 1749. In France, there was the Lettre Persane by Montesquieu, followed by Julie ou la Nouvelle Héloïse uh, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and La Clos, uh, a novel that I'm sure uh, uh, you have read, if not seen the movie, Les Liaisons Dangereuses. Uh, in Germany, Goethe, The Sorrows of John Werther, and Herderling's Hyperion. So, I mean, uh, what Cervantes is anticipating here was a very popular genre in the next uh, uh, century. Um, this exchange of letters in the Quixote also reflects a society in which writing has become a crucial component of life and uh, uh, communications, uh, of life and communications, writing and, and printed documents. Uh, rival uh, oral uh, exchanges. If you have been reading your Eliot, you will have learned that this is a society obsessed uh, with documents, mostly legal documents, uh, uh, which is a class to which some of the letters uh, belong. Uh, letter writing is part of the generation of, of the uh, production of, of legal uh, uh, documents. Uh, so this is a reflection of that, too. Uh, it is also, here in the novel, it is also writing within writing. And the epistles are documents not processed into the fiction, but presented uh, raw, as it were. Meaning, it, is, it doesn't say, Teresa, uh, uh, Sancho wrote to Teresa saying this and that and the other. No. The document, presumably as was dictated by Sancho, of course, he doesn't know how to write. Uh, appears in the novel. Uh, modern, modern fiction will expand on, on this device. I'm thinking here of Joyce, of Dos Passos, of Cortázar, and other writers uh, whose books uh, contain documents such as these letters, uh, unabsorbed into the prose of the, of, of the fiction. Uh, now, Sancho's letter, if we want to also uh, look for the antecedent in part one, uh, is an echo of the one Don Quixote wrote to Dul Dulcinea, and that Sancho, of course, forgot to take with him and then uh, memorized, and we have all those uh, uh, funny uh, episodes in which he tries to, to, to retell it. Uh, as in the first instance, that is, as in that episode or those episodes, uh, the humorous, uh, uh, what is humorous here is that both Sancho and his wife, presumably, are illiterate. So this is an exchange of, of letters uh, between uh, characters who don't know how to read and, uh, and write. The whole issue of the production of the letter and the Duchess overseeing it and all of that uh, is part of the, uh, of the humor here, as uh, the production of the letter for Dulcinea was also part of the, of the humor. Uh, in, uh, in that episode. So now we do move to these uh, outrageous episodes that I want to uh, uh, discuss today. And uh, I'm sure when I mention what they are, you will, you will see why I use that adjective. The first is the episode involving the afflicted matron known as Countess Trifaldi. And uh, Trifaldine of the white beard, her squire. This is one of the wildest inventions of the Duke Stuart and one of the strangest in the whole Quixote with no possible antecedent in part one. That Stuart is described as follows in page 705 of your translation by Jarvis. It says, the Duke had a steward of a very pleasant and facetious wit who represented Merlin and contrived the whole apparatus of the late adventure, 
composed the verses and made the page act dulcinea. And now, with the Duke and Duchess's leave, he prepared another scene, one of the pleasantest and strangest contrivances imaginable." Unquote. Uh, the steward is another internal author, like Sanson Carrasco and Master Peter. Like Sanson Carrasco is one who scripts adventures for Don Quixote. So something that Master Peter doesn't do, but Master Peter is one of the authors within the Quixote. So the steward not only organizes the whole pageant, but also writes the verses, as, we, as, uh, as the quote says, and, and plays the role of Merlin and then of Trifaldin. He is as versatile as Ginés de Pasamonte and even more. Uh, he's a poet. Now, internal authors like him and Sanson Carrasco, uh, in the second part, get to put into action their creations, as, we have, uh, as I have mentioned before, and as you have seen, the, uh, the results are not exactly uh, what they planned, but uh, they do get to put them into action. The staging of uh, his arrival as Trifaldin is theatrical and Baroque in the extreme. Again, the intention is to astonish both with the elaborateness of the props and with their fearful appearance and sounds or noises. So, the, uh, astonish with the with the uh, uh, the act of creation. I mean, uh, uh, the creator creator of these baroque uh, 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 pranks uh, is boasting of his own uh, uh, ability, and also astonished because uh, of the very nature, size, and, and noise. If we go to page uh, seven or eight, seven or nine. Uh, I will read the arrival of this uh, uh, character. And while they were thus in suspense, they perceived two men enter the garden, clad in mourning robes, so long and extended that they trailed upon the ground. They came beating two great drums, covered also with black. By their side came a fife, the fife, black and frightful like the rest. These three were followed by a personage of gigantic stature, not clad, but mantled about with a robe of the blackest dye. The train thereof was of monstrous length. This robe was girt about with a broad black belt at which there hung an immeasurable scimitar in a black scabbard. His face was covered with a transparent black veil, through which appeared a prodigious long beard as white as snow. He marched to the sound of, dr of, dr of drums with much gravity and composure. In short, his huge bulk, his stateliness, his blackness, and his attendants might very well surprise, as they did all who beheld him and were not in the secret. Thus he came with the state and appearance aforesaid, and kneeled down before the duke, who with the rest received him standing. But the duke would in no wise suffer him to speak till he rose up. The monstrous specter did so, and as soon as he was upon his feet, he lifted up his veil and exposed to view the horridest, the longest, whitest, and best furnished beer that human eyes till then had ever beheld. And straight he sent forth his broad and ample breast, a voice grave and sonorous, and fixing his eyes on the duke, he said. Of course, notice the preponderance of black. And notice that as in the pageant in the forest, uh, these, there are many superlatives. Everything is the largest, the whitest, the most horrible. And the intention is to to cause uh, admiration and fear on the spectators. Sancho dives into the Duchess's skirts the moment he sees this apparition. As he, he does whenever he's afraid, and we said the Duke and Duchess's house, he did, he fainted in her arms in the pageant in the forest. And notice also the figure of the monster. I have spoken about the figure of the monster before which was not only uh, uh, made up of the most outrageous 
features, but of contrasting one, like the black dress and the white beard. The monster is a baroque figure. It does not have to be ugly, just composed of clashing features. In Calderón de la Barca, the playwright that I have mentioned several times, uh, in Calderón de la Barca, there are beautiful monsters, namely beautiful women dressed as men. So don't confuse this figure of the monster with the romantic uh, Frankenstein who is uh, ugly, repulsive, uh, and uh, sort of a death, death warmed over type. But this is not the case with these Baroque monsters. Um, the, the important thing in the monster is the clash of opposites. The clash is between the two genders. In the case of the Calderonian figures, uh, we saw that clash in the figure of the Dulcinea, uh, of the pageant in the forest. Such figures are the opposite of Renaissance uh, harmony, but they are, however, announced in the figure of Dorotea in, in part one. Uh, and as in the cave of Montesinos uh, and the pageant in the forest, we have a procession, a parade of freaks and the sound of drums which uh, mark the pace of the whole ensemble. Uh, in these theatrical uh, shows, the characters don't walk, they march. Remember in the, in the cave of Montesinos how all of these uh, uh, eerie kind of women who are, are marching in a procession. And, and of course, in the pageant in the forest, we have a huge uh, procession parade. Uh, so there is no, no natural motion such as walking it is marching to, uh, to, the, to the beat of the drums and the sounds of the various uh, instruments. Now, the most remarkable thing here, of course, uh, is the punishment within all of this fiction uh, that the duenas have suffered. Uh, the predicament of the duenas uh, is again a question of cross-dressing or of cross-gendering. Uh, their mock affliction seems to be an excess of testosterone that provokes a wild growth of facial hair. Remember that they suddenly, within this fiction, boom, uh, uh, have these beards. It is my, it's described in my new detail how the, the hairs are supposed to come out of the pores. and. Uh, This is wildest, the Cervantes said is wildest, you know. This is a hilarious condition and part of the mockery of ladies in waiting in the whole episode. Sancho's diatribe against them perhaps reflects an attitude of the, uh, of the times. Dueña Rodriguez, from whom we will hear more later, mounts a spirited defense. I'm using both Duena and Dueña. Uh, the Spanish is. Uh, Okay, and uh, the, 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 what is used in your translation is the English version. Good old Sebastián de Covarrubias, remember him, the great lexicographer who published in 1611 the Tesoro de la Lengua Castellana, and that I uh, warned you I would uh, mention several times during the semester, says the following in my own translation, defining the dueña. I'm going through all this because I know that this is a very strange figure for someone in the 21st century. Uh, he says, in, old Cast in, the, in the old Castilian language, says good old Sebastián, it meant an old widowed lady. Now, it generally means those who serve wearing long nonish gowns to distinguish them from virgins. And in the palaces, honor duenas are principal ladies who are widowed and the queens and princesses keep them near." Uh, unquote. Meanwhile, Webster defines lady-in-waiting as a lady of rank 
who is a member of the royal household and in attendance uh, of a queen or princess. I suppose, this is me now, I suppose that there is a sexual connotation to this category of women because they are unattached, but presumably available, though not young, unmarried, and virginal. Why so many widows? I mean, uh, the death, uh, 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 people died at, at a younger age in the, in the 16th and 17th centuries. So, and since men normally live a shorter life than women, even today, uh, there are bound to be a lot of, of, of widows around. And what do you do? What do you do with these widows? Uh, where do they go in society? Uh, I guess some might go to uh, the nunnery, go get thee to the to a nunnery to remember Shakespeare. Uh, but others are are there in the palaces. Uh, they are of rank. They are a bit a bit like the segundones. They're the female counterpart of the segundones, but they cannot quite go out and 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 start a career uh, out at sea or in the church or the, so. They. Uh, they are, they are involved in, uh, in, in providing or facilitating sexual encounters. They're go-betweens, they tend to be go-betweens, as happens in the story concocted by the steward. Uh, I think that uh, this is the reason, this sexual uh, sideline uh, of these uh, widows. There are all kinds of jokes about widows and sexuality and all of that in, throughout all traditions. Um, and this is why they are given in jest a strong masculine trait, a, a beard, the opposite of the role they're supposed to play, which is very, very feminine in a sexual uh, way. So the last thing you would expect them to have is a beard. But also, you remember from uh, my explanation of, Celestine, uh, of, of, of Dulcinea's hair that uh, you know, it, it meant also a certain kind of sexuality. Uh, so uh, hair, in the case of the enchanted Dulcinea, meant, remember the, the, the wench that had the mole on her face with some hair that Don Quixote <laughs> said she must have another one on her thigh with hair, etc. Et it means sexual proclivity, being sexually hot. Uh, these women are to be seen as sexually active, but only in, a, only in a sexual way. That is, they are not to be loved and idealized. They're only to be seen as uh, sexual. And this is why the joke of having them grow uh, hair. Uh, now, the story about the Countess Trifaldi, whom we encountered, remember, in Spitzer's article. Remember the long discussion by Spitzer about the Trifaldi, Tres Faldas, and all of that, and how, uh, how these names uh, uh, are made by Cervantes. The story about Countess uh, Trifaldi is very much like that of Princess Micomicona uh, in part one, if you remember that, Dorotea. You know. Except that, that it is madly exaggerated. I mean, you know. there is a fantastic geography outrageously made up names. It is a meta, meta fiction concocted by the characters of the main fiction. But here, in contrast to, to part one, uh, the process is much more premeditated, complicated, and is played out as, as in a theater, not out on the road. If you remember, the priest and Dorotea make up the story of Micomicona uh, on the go. Uh, and that's why she makes mistakes, remember. Uh, the steward has uh, taken his time to compose this one. This is a whole story very, very well wrought, as it were. Maguncia and Archipiela are the deceased uh, 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 parents. M Maguncia. Uh, they are funny names. I mean, the first is the German town of Mainz, which sounds very strange uh, to the Spanish ear. Maguncia, Maguncia, Mainz in Germany. And uh, 
The second refers to archipelago, a series of, of islands. Uh, the, these names are geographic in origin because the, the story has something of, a something of a geographic fable. Candaya is another, like El Reino Micomicón is a made up uh, kingdom. But of all these names, the funniest is Antonomasia. The young woman. Because it is the name that takes the name of names. That it is a, it's a rhetorical figure. It names uh, an, uh, uh, Antonomasia, the rhetorical figure that uh, uh, it is a rhetorical figure to name that which is the quintessence of something. A Hercules for a strong man is an Antonomasia. A Hitler for an evil man is an antonomasia, uh, from the Greek to call by another name, the use of an epithet or title instead of the proper name of a person, as when, I'm quoting Webster, when his honor is used for a judge or when instead of Aristotle we say the philosopher. The use of a proper name instead of a common noun as when an eminent orator is called Demosthenes, unquote. It is something like saying par excellence, uh, the quintessence of something. So why is she called Antonomasia? Uh, she is given the name of a linguistic or rhetorical term because she is made up of words. She is a fiction within the fiction made up by the steward. So she is not to have the name of a real person because she is made up of words. This is what this is. Uh, this name is, is underlining. Also, uh, she is so named because she and her story are quintessential, archetypal, commonplace. Joaquin Casalduero, whom I have mentioned uh, before several times, uh, Casalduero was a very uh, prominent Hispanist in the 40s, 50s. He, he, um, he was very impressed with German criticism. And so he named all of his books Sentido y Forma de, Sense and Meaning of, Don Quixote, Celestina, Novelas Ejemplares, Sin un Form. It's derived from German criticism. But in spite of that, he was a very good uh, uh, critic. And I'm, I'm quoting. Uh, uh, from his book called Sentido y Forma del Quixote, of course. Uh, and he says, uh, Don Quixote in his purity launches forth to disenchant, to save the lovers and the dueñas, to make them recover their original form. He fights for the whole of humanity, which is why the story is filled with a sense of the real, without alluding to anyone in particular, because all are involved. The name of the seduced young woman is Antonomasia. What he means is that Antonomasia's name suggests that Don Quixote fights for all seduced and punished young ladies. And this is the sense of, of her name, the prototypical one. But also, since the issue here is one more time of marriage, unequal marriage, freedom, social status, I think Cervantes, with his name, is perhaps poking fun at himself for repeating the same story under various guises throughout the Quixote. He's saying, well, this one is antonomasia. It's the prototypical of all the stories, Dorotea, Marcela, and so forth, that I have been telling, and I'm telling again. So I'm making fun of myself by giving her this very, very funny name. He may also be casting a resigned and ironic uh, glance at human nature for always repeating itself. Young women will always be seduced by charming young men and trouble will ensue. This is what a name like Antonomasia suggests too. The rhetorical name also reveals that his proxy, his stand-in author, the steward, is a learned man. 
It is as if we called a literary character, I've been thinking of what other rhetorical name could we give a literary character? Anaphora, for instance. Anaphora is the literary, uh, is, is the, is the, uh, is the, uh, the figure of speech uh, uh, the, in, by which a, an orator repeats over and again something, uh, as in the case of, uh, of the assistant, of Master Peter's uh, uh, assistant, when he says, look, 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 or when the preacher says, repent, you sinners, and says it over and over again, that is anaphora. Uh, I don't know if uh, you agree, you can come up perhaps with even a, a better one, synesthesia you could call a literary character. These are also very good names if you have a pet to name. Uh, if you have a parrot that repeats the same thing over and over, you could call her anaphora. In any case, just a, just a thought. But it's very funny to have a character called anaphora. It's supposed to be very funny. It, it's, uh, it's a sophisticated joke. I mean, not everybody, not everybody knows what, an, an, uh, what, what uh, antonomasia means. But, uh, but it is supposed to be uh, funny, and it is. Now, if in part one we learned to look for the story behind the story, in part two we learned how a story is made, and the way that this uh, steward appears, and the way that the story is told, and is uh, uh, presented and represented is a way of showing uh, the inner workings of the story. So this is one way that we can also contrast between the two parts. In part one, we're looking for the story behind the story of what Cardenio said. Here, we are shown the stage props, the machinery, the, st the stage machinery uh, through which the story is being made. Part of it is the, the name of this, of this character. Now, so to sum up the story made up by the steward, Maguncia and Archipiela are the parents of Princess Antonomasia, impregnated by Don Clavijo, a Don Juan type, with the connivance of Dueña Trifaldi. Uh, notice that Clavijo is a uh, phallic name. Um, a clavija. Uh, a clavija is a peg. Clavija is a peg uh, in, a, uh, in a string instrument. Uh, now, now they are, uh, they have a little mechanism with a screw uh, type thing. Uh, but the old clavijas, the old pegs, were simply uh, stuck, stuck in the, by pressure into the wood. And hence the, the name. Uh, Clavijo is a very uh, phallic name. Another joke on the part of Cervantes. Now, Dueña Trifaldi is a Celestina type. Remember Celestina, the go between 1499, who arranges for their encounters. But she falls in love herself with a young man, which gives the story an original twist, a kind of sophisticated twist. This old, older woman uh, has fallen in love with Clavijo, who's a very charming guy who plays the guitar and all of that. It is as if she vicariously had the affair with Clavijo through uh, antonomasia. So there is, a, uh, there is a, a clever sophistication involved in the, in the story here. Uh, the steward is a very uh, a clever uh, author. Now, Don Clavijo does marry Antonomasia, as he had promised, but the queen dies of grief because of the disparity in social class between them. He is merely a knight. He has the don, so she's, he's a knight. But she's a princess. Antonomasia is the princess. So Malambruno, a giant and the, and the queen's first cousin, who is the pandafilando of this story, Malambruno. turns them into the ornament atop a sarcophagus. Now, 
uh, if Panfi Pandafilando, remember, was the Panfilanderer, the one who had many affairs with women, Panfilanderer, Malambruno is a bad man. From mal, evil or bad, and hombre, man. Or on Bruno, manly. He's a bad man, Malam Bruno. It's also a comical name. Uh, in any case, this is the, uh, the gist of the story, page 719. Upon the queen's sepulcher appeared, mounted on a wooden horse, the giant Malam Bruno, her cousin German, who besides being cruel, is an enchanter also. The giant, in revenge for his cousin's death and in chastisement of the boldness of Don Clavijo and the folly of Antonomasia, left them both enchanted by his art upon the very sepul sepulchre. He converted into her converted into a monkey of brass and him into a fearful crocodile of an unknown metal. And between them lies a plate of metal likewise with letters engraved upon it in the Syriac language which being rendered into Candayan and now into Castilian contains this sentence. These two presumptuous lovers shall not recover their pristine form till the valorous Manchegan shall enter into single combat with me for the destinies reserved this unheard of adventure for his great valor alone. Unquote. Notice the Baroque suffusing of love with death. The lover's likeness will lie upon the tomb of the dead mother. Don't overlook that. The steward author of the story is learned as well as clever, as we found in the pageant of the forest with all of the Dante allusions and in his name of, of Antonomasia. Here he has contrived a truly Baroque image in the sarcophagus. I have given you uh, a, um, uh, a handout. Uh, on the one uh, hand, I could not uh, uh, resist uh, having a, uh, a Doré drawing of the duenas uh, as they are supposed to appear in this episode. But on the other, I have a series, a series of sarcophagi because uh, uh, American tombs uh, tend to be very simple. Uh, there is a headstone and then the tomb is just uh, the grass covering uh, the body or the casket or something. It's something very beautiful about it. Uh, dust uh, will become dust and so forth and so on. But uh, in the European tradition, the continental, in, the co in the continental tradition, uh, uh, tombs tend to be much more elaborate, ornate, and uh, made of stone uh, or, or uh, hard surfaces. They're like little uh, buildings. That is a whole architecture of tombs. So what is a sarcophagus? Remember the etymology I gave you when discussing the cave of Montesinos episode. Sarcos in, in Greek, flesh, and phagain to eat. So the sarcophagus eats the flesh of the dead body. Uh, sarcophagi were common among the ancient Greeks and Romans. You have some here. Uh, it was a limestone coffin or tomb, often inscribed and elaborately ornamented. The point of the sarcophagus in this story is the display and the ornamentation, which are the Baroque elements as in the figure of the monster. Remember the, that in Montesinos' cave, the ornament on Durandarte's sarcophagus was his own cadaver. The statue is made of flesh. It was an, inver an inversion with nature playing the role of art. Here, we have a much more elaborate uh, kind of ornamentation. How, how do we interpret the figures of the monkey and the crocodile here? There are monkeys in Cervantes, as we saw with Mico Bicoma, uh, and also uh, the monkey that Master Peter uh, had with him. 
I, as I said in the, when mentioning those episodes, they allude to mimesis, to representation, because they like to imitate humans. Here, uh, the ensemble could allude to, to lust. The croc eats the monkey, as it were. Uh, but both animals, are uh, the monkey and the crocodile, are supposed to be demonic and symbols of dissimulation, of fakery. This is why they grace the tomb of these lovers. Now, the story of Antonomasia and Don Clavijo is one of consummation and pregnancy. I think that the pregnancy is part of the Baroque grotesquery of the episode, as is the interested intervention of the duenia, of the, uh, what I mean by that is that there is something grotesque about the go-between, uh, the older woman falling in love with uh, the young man, and that the same kind of grotesqueness uh, is involved in the pregnancy. These contrasts uh, you will find in the poetry, for instance, of Altisidora, when she appears and sings a song, there will be sublime lines followed by very vulgar ones. And this is, uh, I think, the effect here of the, uh, of the pregnancy. Pregnancy would be unthinkable in the stories of part one involving Dorotea, Marcela, Lucinda, or Soraida, although consummation did take place with Dorotea. But pregnancy literalizes lust, uh, removing idealizations about love. It, underscore, it underscores love's functional biological drive to reproduction. Uh, pregnancy is not very sublime. It's not part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, courtly love tradition. It is uh, uh, unthinkable to imagine Beatrice, Dante's beloved, pregnant, or any of these ladies. Uh, so there, there will be a, a, another pregnancy later involving Dueña Rodriguez's daughter, and we will discuss that episode. Uh, at this stage in the Quixote, we are well beyond the idealized love of Grisostomo and Marcela, or of Don Quixote and Dulcinea. Dulcinea has been enchanted, looks like, like, a, like a, a country wench. So uh, now we come uh, to the end of this adventure, to the end of this very well wrought story that the steward has composed and whose inner workings we are uh, observing as we read. We move now to the episode of Clavileño. Clavileño became such, uh, or has become such an uh, an ingrained uh, name in the Spanish tradition that there was a very famous literary journal in the 30s in Spain called Clavileño. Now, uh, this story brings to a close the story of the bearded dueñas and the disenchantment of Antonomasia and Clavijo. Now, first, the uh, chapter begins with a mock tirade of self-praise on the part of Cervantes about his narrative techniques and characters, page 720, 21. In reality and truth, all who delight in such histories as this ought to be thankful to its original author, Sid Hamet, for his curious exactness in recording the minutest circumstances thereof, without omitting anything, how trifling soever, but bringing everything distinctly to light. He paints thoughts, discovers imaginations, answers the silent, clears up doubts, resolves arguments, and lastly manifests the least atoms of the inquisitive desire. Oh, most celebrated author, oh, happy Don Quixote, oh, famous Dulcinea, oh, facetious Sancho Panza, live each jointly and severally infinite ages for the general pleasure and pastime of the living. Now, this is very funny, Cervantes praising himself. Uh, and he is praising himself uh, by anatomizing, as it were, the, the, the props of his own fiction or of his own, uh, uh, the makeup of his own art. Uh, 
What Cervantes is doing is uh, dismissing Aristotelian injunctions concerning the writing of history in this passage. According to the philosopher, to use an antonomasia, to refer to uh, Aristotle, history should not concern it itself with minutiae, but only with that which is relevant to the grand narratives which concern itself with major historical figures, not with characters of the ilk Cervantes is dealing with, nor should history dwell on their thoughts, except when expressed in highly rhetorical speeches that are presumed to express and display their personalities. Now, this is so against our modern conceptions of history uh, that uh, and Cervantes is already aware of it, because we, we, we do want details about uh, characters, in the important and non-important characters in history, because we, we feel that in the details, uh, you may find the truth. No, not in this con Renaissance conception of, of, of history. This is the, what, uh, what I have just uh, 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 given you is the core of the Renaissance poetics uh, of history. Uh, but in this mock history that Cervantes is writing, uh, it is precisely the particular details as well as the thoughts and imaginings of the characters that are of interest. The most the remotest uh, uh, element of this Renaissance poetics of history is the question of the speeches. Because, of course, there were no uh, recording devices at the time. So when you hear a, a king uh, deliver uh, an oration, uh, it is all made up by the historian whose art uh, uh, involved the creation of such uh, speeches on the part of these historical characters that would reveal their personality. It was a way of, 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 of delving into their the psychology. Now, I know this is completely uh, uh, against our notions of, of, of how to write history, but this is why Cervantes is underlining it here. Uh, he is interested in the details and he's interested in the imaginings and the thoughts of characters who are not that important, but are the characters who will, will people the novel that he is uh, uh, creating. So, in other words, this tirade shows that Cervantes is increasingly aware that is creating a new kind of writing, which is derived from both history and genres old and new, such as uh, the epic, the picaresque, and the romances of chivalry. The tirade, by the way, are to be presumed to be uttered by the second author or, or translator, who frequently comments on Sid Ahmed's work, a, a historian, uh, remember, uh, who's uh, a Moor, are given to prevarication. So we have all of these folds and layers of, of irony still uh, present. But this is important because of what I said before as stories in, in, in part two uh, displaying the, how they are uh, uh, made up. So we move to Clavileño. First, the name of the horse. Uh, it is derived from clavo. which means a nail. But there is also an echo of clavija, the word that I used before, that I mentioned before in reference to don clavijo, because the, the clavija itself is derived from clavo, meaning something that is stuck. Um, and this alludes to the steering uh, peg, or what I, being a pilot, would call the yoke of this uh, to uh, steer. This, uh, this horse. Um, and leño. Leño, which uh, mean, means wood, which is what the horse is made of. But leño or leña is a kind of wood used for fire wood, for burning. The more noble wood used by carpenters to make furniture or cabinets is called madera. Of course, Cervantes is too uh, unwieldy a uh, word. Uh, and also, Cervantes is underlining that this wood of which uh, clavileño is made is not of the noblest uh, wood. Uh, there is something demeaning to leño, clavileño used to name Clavileño. I think I, I, I kept thinking what would be a good uh, translation uh, into English or what, a rendering into, 
I thought that uh, the horse could be called firewood, or he could be called, I think that the best would be woody. I think that if we were to really translate uh, everything in the book, uh, Clavileño would be called woody, as in woody woodpecker. Um, but Jarvis, Jarvis wisely sticks to Clavileño. It doesn't translate uh, that. But that's, that's what the sense of it is. Now, the adventure of Clavileño is derived from several similar ones in romances of chivalry. So the parody of romances of chivalry is carried out now, not so much by Don Quixote and his actions, but by the Duke's servants, particularly the steward. He's not only learned and clever, as I have been emphasizing, but he's also a reader of romances of chivalry and, of course, of the first part of the Quixote as well. The motif of the flying horse has a long tradition, including Pegasus in Greek mythology, but the figure traveled long in time and space. After the Indian and Persian versions, he appears in the Arabic story, the Ebony Horse, in the Thousand and One Nights. From there, it was disseminated through France and, uh, and Spain. Uh, I won't give you the names or the titles of some of these romances in which it appears, but it is a figure that appears uh, fairly frequently. So obviously this reveals the steward's uh, knowledge of these romances of, uh, of chivalry. Now, what is one of the interesting uh, uh, features of the flight is the all-encompassing view from above that the characters have, presumably have, which is typical of the Baroque, uh, the Baroque effort at all-inclusiveness, which is now available with the knowledge that the earth is round and complete within itself. The episode has a great deal to do with contemporary discoveries about the infinite dimensions of the cosmos, about which I've spoken before, and the inability of Ptolemaic and Aristotelian cosmologists to represent such a, such a cosmos. Don Quixote and Sancho believe to be going through the spheres as described in the old cosmology, and this is, and of course, they encourage this by having this uh, fire next to their beards or to their faces, so they figure they're going through the sphere of fire. Uh, and Sancho claims that he took a stroll among the constellations as they're described in this old cosmology. A corollary of uh, the new discoveries is that the world is one and the same everywhere. Uh, Sancho had introduced the topic a few pages before when, upon hearing the story of Antonomasia and Clavijo in Candaya, he says, page 718, what? Are there court alguacils, poets, and roundelays in Candaya too? Oh, if so, I swear, I think the world is the same everywhere. Sancho is, uh, uh, thinks that the, this, the world is the same uh, everywhere. And this is what uh, the view from above uh, 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 suggests. Clavileño, Clavileño's flight in the Quixote is the correlative opposite, of course, of the Cave of Montesinos descent, down, up. No? Appropriately, given his increasing importance, it is now Sancho who tells a story like the one Don Quixote told after emerging from the cave. He speaks of a celestial flight down, uh, drawn from similar flights of the spirit uh, that are available in Cicero, Somnium Scipionis, in Boethius, the Consolation of Philosophy, and even in Fray Luis de Leon's Still Night, Noche Serena. Fray Luis de Leon is another great poet of the 16th century that is somewhere in the background here. Um, as in other episodes in the second part, Don Quixote shows real courage before, before what appears to be actual danger. So does Sancho. Uh, but they have played, again, the role of objects of the other's uh, amusement. So the Clavileño episode is another prank, another burla is the word that I keep using, burla, prank.
at the expense of Don Quixote and Sancho, conceived and executed by the Duke's minions, particularly the steward. All of these pranks are a critique of mimesis, in that they are literary or theatrical acts of representation which are presented as pitiable attempts, ultimately given up in favor of humor. These are attempts at literary representation at mimesis, and they wound up being funny. This, I think, encapsulates Cervantes' own effort in the Quixote. They are dramatizations of his plight and answer to the problem, trying to represent uh, reality and uh, coming up with a, a funny uh, version of it. Uh, but there is something else too, perhaps even more important in this prax, and in the clavileño one in particular. Well, it is true that Don Quixote and Sancho are made fun of, and that they endure hardship and danger when the whole contraption blows up. It is they who show courage and determination, and it is they who do fly in their imaginations while the pranksters remain earthbound. Some, like the Duke and Duchess, astonished and even frightened by the machinery that they have constructed or had constructed. I think this sums up, it seems to me, Cervantes' attitude towards the protagonist. He may very well be ridiculous in his efforts, but his efforts have a certain nobleness that others lack. Just as he emerges unscathed from the explosion and fall, his dignity also remains untouched. In brief, Clavileño does afford Don Quixote a flight at once heroic and inspired. As in the episode of the lions, I repeat, he has demonstrated his courage, even if the context is not a heroic one.